Thank you for watching videos by Jeff Sibelius and LandonAirPhotos.com. We just returned from a vacation at Yellowstone in the Grand Tetons. Along the way, we identified several tips to help you shoot better photos and videos at these parks. If you fly drones, many of these tips will apply to you as well. The ideas I teach in this episode will make your vacation photos and videos better, whether you're shooting with a drone, action camera, DSLR, or cell phone. While we were visiting Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons, my wife Monique and I kept a list of tips and best practices that we felt gave us the best pictures and videos possible. Some of these tips apply to everyone, including people who just shoot snapshots with their cell phones. Other tips are for more advanced photographers with more advanced knowledge and equipment. So, regardless what type of photographer you are, this video has something for you. Drone operators, now you know you can't fly a drone in a national park, but you'll find a variety of neat scenes to shoot from the air outside the parks. Just understand that many of the tips I had discussed in this episode apply to you as well. And I'll let everyone in on a little secret. Some of these tips apply only to the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone, but most will help you capture better travel images for any vacation destination. Over the course of this video, I'll discuss several products that I used and found to be valuable on our trip. You will find links in the description below to order these products from Amazon if you're interested. I paid for these products on my own, and I recommend only products that I use. Our first tips take place while you're planning your vacation. Getting good photos starts as you prepare for the trip. Tip 1. Think about timing as you plan. No matter what gear you use, light, how much there is of it, what direction it's coming from, what color it is, has a big impact on your images. One of the easiest ways to get good colors in your photos and video is to shoot with the sun to your back. When you shoot into the sun, you can lose color and experience exposure problems. Compare this photo taken with the sun to my left shoulder to the same scene three minutes later shot while pointing into the sun. Let me clarify, when I say behind you, I'm not saying it has to be directly to your back. Look at this graphic. As long as the sun is somewhere in the green half of the circle, you should get good colors. As the sun moves closer to your side rather than your back, you will see more shadows in your photos. Shadows can help give your subject texture and depth, so you may or may not want them. As the sun moves from your sides to behind the subject, it's more likely to cause loss of color, sun flare, and distortions to your images. Think about this when you choose the time of day when to visit various locations. Grand Tetons National Park is a great example of this. Look at this map of Grand Teton National Park. You will do most of your photography from two main roads, both running north and south. To the west of these roads are the mountains. Well, now, you know that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So, you know that if you want the best colors in your shots with the sun at your back, the best time to shoot for most of this park is morning, from sunup to past noon and into the early afternoon. When you get later into the afternoon, you will be pointing into the sun, especially from the most popular vantage points in the south part of the park. Ideally, you want to hit the park early so you can maximize those hours when the sun is behind you. Early in the morning is especially good because the wind is often minimal, making the water as smooth as glass, and that's how you get beautiful reflection shots like these. And with sunrise shots, you also get the warmth of golden hours sunlight. Now that doesn't mean afternoons are no good at the Grand Tetons. I am on the inner loop road heading north. We just passed uh, the North Jenny Lake Junction. If you find yourself in the afternoon looking for places to take pictures, when you're at this point in the park, you're really shooting more south. So the direction of the sunlight should be a little bit less of a problem 
is when you're on the uh, southern stretches of the roads and you're pointing to the west. Also, there are great spots to shoot sunsets like Schwabacher's Landing, Snake River Overlook, and Oxbow Bend. And this all holds true for Yellowstone as well. Just consider the direction of light as you decide when you plan to visit each attraction. I mentioned sunrise and sunset. Do you know when those will occur? When we were in Wyoming in June, sunrise was around 5.30 a.m. and sunset was around 8.30 p.m. In January, sunrise is about 8 a.m. and sunset is 5 p.m. If you want sunrise or sunset pictures, you need to know when they will occur. We literally structured our schedule so we could leave the hotel by 4.30 or 5 a.m. most days just to get those sunrises and maximize our morning hours. Getting up also means fewer people at the park, which is another big benefit. That said, you will always deal with crowds at national parks. Look at this sunrise at Schwabacher's Landing. All by myself. Just me and a couple dozen others. Anything you can do to shoot when others aren't around is a big advantage. Think about what equipment you plan to use. If you plan to shoot pictures with a cell phone, you may not need anything but a cleaning cloth for your lens and screen. More on that later. If you plan to shoot video with your cell phone, you really need to get a gimbal, which makes your motion smooth and less jittery. Monique uses the DJI OM4 gimbal with her iPhone, and it helped her to get some remarkable footage, as you can see on screen now. If you use a small point-and-shoot camera like the Sony ZV-1, the Hohem iSteady Multi is a gimbal that works very well to smooth out your video. If you plan to use other types of cameras, you may need special equipment depending on what you plan to do. Want to shoot waterfall long exposure photos? You will need a tripod, a neutral density filter, and ideally, a remote shutter release. You'll need the tripod and shutter release for astrophotography as well. Taking that long lens out to shoot pictures of animals at a distance, the tripod or monopod comes in handy with those big lenses too. And that leads me to the question of what camera or cameras you use. You've got a wide range of choices. Simple cameras are simple to use, but they don't take the best photos and they can be limited. More advanced cameras take better photos, but they're typically more expensive and they're more involved to use. You need to balance convenience, cost, and capability to pick the best camera for you. The cameras we used on this vacation were DJI Mavic Air 2 and Air 2S, the GoPro Hero 9, the Insta360 1R 1-inch Edition, Sony ZV-1 with the Hohem iSteady Multi Gimbal, Panasonic DCG9 with a variety of lenses, Nikon D5600 with a variety of lenses, Nikon D7100 with the Nikon 70-200 f2.8 lens, and the iPhone with the DJI OM4 gimbal. I'll discuss these cameras in greater detail in a separate video. Look for a link in the upper right corner when that video is done. If you want to buy a camera for your vacation, that video will be very helpful to you. For now, I'll sum it up here to say that the right camera or cameras for you depend on whether you plan to shoot stills, video, or both, and how you balance the variables of convenience, cost, and capability. If you are shooting with a mirrorless or DSLR, you also need to pick what lenses to take. At Grand Teton National Park, I shot almost exclusively with wide to moderate telephoto focal length lenses, from 10 millimeters to 70 millimeters in most cases. Yellowstone was another matter. For geyser basins, hot springs, the Grand Canyon area, the wide angle and moderate telephoto ranges worked very well. However, with all the animal photo opportunities, I was frequently shooting up to 140 millimeters with my D5600, and I shot over 900 photos with the 200 millimeter lens. For video, I found the 12 to 60 millimeter lens fit most of my needs. I did use the 35 to 100 a couple times, but I probably could have left that at home as I didn't shoot animal video. All that's to say, in Yellowstone, if you own a full span of focal lengths, take them all. You will use them, but you probably use your wide angle to moderate telephoto range lenses most often. 
The last of my planning tips is to recommend two books. Dirt Cheap Photo Guide to Grand Teton National Park by Jeff Clow and Photographing Yellowstone National Park, Where to Find Perfect Shots and How to Take Them by Gustav W. Vertiber. These books provide a detailed information about places around the two parks, what times are best, what angles to look for, etc. Some of the information is very technical. They may advise what focal length and what aperture to use for a given shot, for example. But the majority of these books will be very helpful to anyone who wants to take great photos or videos, regardless what camera they use. I found them to be fast reads and very helpful. The books cost $15 or $16 each, and it's money really well spent. So those are my tips about planning for your trip. From here on, I'll talk about things to improve your photography and videography while you're at Grand Teton National Park or Yellowstone. My first tip while you're at the parks is shoot it. It's pretty simple, right? But here's what I mean. If you see something and think about shooting it, go ahead and do it. Don't think, just shoot. Shoot things that aren't great pictures or videos, but will help you reference things in the future. Things like signs, restaurant names, menus, what you ate for dinner, your cabin or tent, whatever. You see a different angle? Shoot it. Think it might look better zoomed in? Shoot it both ways. Portrait or landscape? Shoot both. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Look, there are more than 10,000 hydrothermal features at Yellowstone, including 500 geysers. When you look at a hot spring photo six months after the trip, will you remember which one it was? Will you even remember which basin the spring was at? Yeah, you will if you shoot pictures of the basin sign and the placard in front of the spring with its name. Shoot. As far as I'm concerned, the most expensive thing you can bring home with you from a vacation is an empty media card. You spend a fortune on your equipment, use up your valuable PTO, pay thousands of dollars for the trip, and then fail to shoot lots of pictures? I don't understand. Along those lines, when you're shooting video, talk. Explain what you're doing for the recording. Leave audio notes for yourself to use later. Boca Spring. We're at Black Sands Basin. This is Sunset Lake. This is pretty. You go that way and then you're on to Fairy Falls. And unfortunately, <laughs> this is taking you up to the Overlook. You can get some sun now for color. Little shot with the GoPro here. We're on the back side of the Devil's Tower. Not only did I take verbal notes during my clips, after I finished with the location, I'd sit in the car and just record a few notes about what we experienced. Those recordings are invaluable later on as we remember our trip. I came home from this vacation with more than 1,700 video clips. There is no chance I will remember what I was doing, where I was located, what I was experiencing for each clip unless I record that information as I shoot. You should too. So, a previous tip was shoot it. My next tip is shoot it now. In Yellowstone, we were driving along the Upper Loop Road and I saw a beautiful lake scene. I decided to come back the next day and get it. And when I came back, the lighting had changed or maybe I wasn't in the right spot. I didn't get the shot that I saw because I waited to shoot it. When you see a shot or think of a shot, shoot it right then. Don't wait. Don't plan to get it later. You'll forget. You won't get back there. Lighting conditions will change. It will rain. A buffalo will block you from coming back. Any of a hundred things could keep you from getting that shot later. So just stop what you're doing and shoot it now. My next tip is almost opposite of the last. Be patient. Sometimes it's worth the effort to wait for a shot. Maybe if you wait for a couple minutes, the moose will come out of the shadows. Shoot the picture now and then give it a couple minutes to see if the moose moves. Want a picture of a scene without people in it? Just hold on. You may catch a break in the traffic. Sometimes you want to wait for clouds. Here is a picture of opalescent pool with clouds overhead. Here's the same shot five minutes later after the sun came out. Look at the difference in colors. Five minutes after that, the clouds covered the sun again, so it really was a matter of waiting for the opportunity and shooting when I had the chance. 
At Yellowstone, you will walk through steam. You will get sprayed by a geyser. The steam and water are highly acidic and can damage your lenses. You can also buy screen protectors for your camera's LCD screens. Always, always, always carry a lens cleaning kit in your pocket at Yellowstone. Our lenses would get fouled constantly. Clean them constantly or you will find that many of your pictures will have spots on them. Here's one for more advanced photographers. A circular polarizer is worth using at Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone. It cuts the glare and reflection on water and influences colors in your shots, notably blue and green. When I use a circular polarizer filter, I shoot the same shot several times, rotating the filter slightly between each shot. Later on, I can pick which one I like best. Here are some more examples of how much a circular polarizer filter can change the colors and reflections in your shots. You can use a circular polarizer for video as well. Even the Insta360 action camera has a polarizer filter available for it. Back to the basic tips. Always be ready to shoot. With all the animals at these parks, you never know when a photo op will present itself. At the Grand Tetons, we were surprised when a fox came out of nowhere. I got this on video because I had the Insta360 ready to go. I was shooting like two seconds after I first saw the fox. This situation is also an example of me not being prepared. My Nikon was hanging around my neck and I grabbed it and fired away. Unfortunately, it wasn't set correctly. The camera was set in aperture preferred mode since I had been shooting landscapes, so the shutter speed was very slow and the pictures ended up being blurry. We tried to be ready to shoot at any moment, even when we were driving around the parks. Okay, let me show you how we had the car set up with cameras while we were on our vacation. First of all, in the door for the driver's side, I kept an action camera uh, pretty much all at all times. Uh, this was so I could grab it and shoot out the window if, if we uh, saw something that we wanted to get a quick shot of. Normally I kept the GoPro in the door. I'm recording with that right now. Uh, so right now I've got the other camera, the other action cam, which is the Insta360. I've got that in there. Sometimes I'd keep the Insta360 there with the GoPro if we were going to, if I thought we were going to see animals, like when we were going through Lamar Valley. Uh, other times, I would put the uh, the Insta360 right here in the center console. That way, uh, either one of us could get to it if uh, if we wanted to do that. Down here on the floor, on the passenger side, kept my Nikon D5600 with the 18 to 140 millimeter lens. This is my primary still image camera, and that 18 to 140 lens is a really good range for shooting at Yellowstone and, and Grand Tetons, uh, and so I kept that handy at all times. Now finally, if I reach back behind the passenger's front seat, I can get this thing. This is the D7100 with an eight, with a uh, 70 to 200 millimeter lens on it. This is in the car. It stayed in the car all the time, but it was here for one purpose, and that was if we're driving along and we saw uh, animals. Uh, I can quickly get to this and shoot the longer range uh, shots with a really good quality lens. Uh, but there's no way I'm lugging this thing around with me because it's, it's just too heavy. So it stayed in the car. I used it strictly for shooting pictures of animals and it worked out great for that. Put that back. So that's it for my cameras. So I kept my uh, iPhone, this is his phone on here right now, but I kept a phone on, on the uh, gimbal, the OM4, so that if we came across something um, on my side of the car or I saw something that, that Jeff didn't see, I could very quickly pull this out and start recording and you know, roll the window down so that I didn't have spots and such and I could actually record. I did keep the wrist strap on my wrist tightened down so that I would not lose it or drop it if we were driving. Yep, I get it. That's hardcore. Most likely, you don't need four or five or six cameras to get great shots on the road. 
but you should keep one or two cameras, batteries charged, all settings set within quick reach as you travel around the parks. If you need to dig into your camera bag and change all the settings when you see a great shot along the road, you're probably going to miss the shot. Now earlier I suggested that you plan to visit locations when the sun is behind your back. Sometimes that isn't possible, as we discovered when we visited Mount Rushmore. The sun was coming down, blinding our view of the monument. You always want to shoot with the sun to your back or to your sides, but definitely behind you. Sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't work out that you can do that. And when you're pointing into the sunlight, as you can start to see here on this picture here, uh, that sun will cause lens flare, distortions, loss of color, things you don't want in your shot. So let's pretend in this shot that the light pole to the right is, is where the sun is, the light at the top of that light pole. And this tree just to the left of it, that's the subject that I want to shoot. Well, again, if the sun, if it got a bright sun at that point in the sky, it's going to distort my shot and ruin my shot. So the only thing I can do at this point is use something like a tree and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to let the tree block the sun. So I'm going to keep, go behind the tree to the point where the, that light pole or the sun is uh, behind the tree. And now that direct light is being blocked from my lens and my exposure should be a whole lot better. Now I got the tree in the picture and that's probably unavoidable. If I'm shooting with a camera that has a zoom lens on it, I can zoom in and crop out the tree just by doing that. Otherwise, I can zoom in in post-production and crop it out. At Mount Rushmore, we used a building. We found that we could stand next to the building to block the sun and still frame the shot of the monument. This may have been a situation where being patient would have worked, waiting until the sun dropped below the horizon for a nice sunset shot. This one is for Yellowstone. Do not use a tripod on the boardwalks. Look at how narrow this boardwalk is. Someone could easily trip on your tripod and fall into the dangerous, highly acidic, very hot water or soil. People have died falling off these boardwalks. No video is worth that. If you need stabilization on the boardwalk, use a monopod or a gimbal. You might not believe it, but your camera's flash can improve your pictures outdoors, especially on portraits. Look at the heavy shadows on Monique's face. Adding the flash from the camera, called a fill flash, can fill in and soften those shadows. Here's another picture of Monique. Notice how dull the colors are on her face and blouse because the sun is coming from behind her. Here's the same shot with a fill flash. See how the skin tones and blouse colors are more vibrant? Look at this shot. A fill flash would have improved our skin tones in this early morning photo. When shooting people pictures outdoors, try shooting with and without a flash both ways. You'll find that very often you get better skin colors with the flash. This one is for videographers. When you move as you record, remember to move as slowly as you can. Be absurd with how slow you move. If you move too fast, the image is difficult to watch. If you decide to zoom in during post-production, you magnify everything, including the speed of your motion. Now you can speed up motion in post with no problem, but it's tough to slow it down unless you shoot at a high frame rate. So discipline yourself to move very slowly as you shoot. And unless you use a camera with excellent image stabilization, like the GoPro or the Insta 361R, a gimbal is the best choice to make your motion smooth and steady. Another one for videographers. As you can see, I use a mini tripod as the grip for my Insta360. When I want the most stable video from that camera, I set the tripod on a rock, fence, or other surface. In this shot, I put the tripod on a rock and held it in place, and it recorded very well. I'll put the link in the description for the mini tripod I use. I love using this as a grip and a tripod. Now, if you don't have a mini tripod, try bracing the camera on or against something to stabilize the shot. Get bug cleaner in your windshield wiper spray. I bet you didn't think of that one. 
We didn't do this, and it was almost impossible to keep the windshield clear of bird droppings and bug splatters. Make sure you put bug cleaner fluid in your car before you go, or your video will look like this. Here's another tip for advanced photographers. I have set out all the camera equipment I brought on this trip. Now, if you think I lugged all of this around everywhere I went, you're nuts. We walked over 60 miles on this vacation, and I had no intention of doing that as a pack mule. Here's what I did to manage all the gear. I kept a large backpack in the car at all times. I used it to store the things I didn't want to use all the time. My G9 camera and lenses, long lenses for the Nikon, shutter releases, extra batteries, stuff like that. When I walked around the park, I used a smaller camera backpack. In that, I only carried the things I needed for what I was doing right then. Now that required some thinking in advance. I made decisions about what type of gear I would use for different settings. If I was walking around a geyser basin, I didn't need my tripod video setup or my long Nikon lenses. All I needed was the Nikon camera with a wide angle and 18 to 140 lens, my Insta360, maybe the GoPro if I wanted to do some video logging, a few extra batteries, lens cleaner, that's it. Doing a hike, same setup as above with my walking stick monopod. The point is, before I started touring any location, I thought about what I'd need for that specific location, and that's all I carried with me. I used one camera bag for storage and carried the other one with me, and it worked out great. So there's my list of tips to get the best photos and videos when visiting Grand Teton National Park or Yellowstone. Most of the tips apply to anyone, from a shooter who shoots snapshots with their cell phone, all the way up to the advanced DSLR shooter. As I said before, you will find links in the description below to order the various products I've covered in this video, available from Amazon. That concludes this episode. On screen, you'll find a playlist of videos from our vacation to Yellowstone and Grand Tetons, including photo essays, tutorials, drone video, and more. Be sure to click the Cartoon Jeff to subscribe to the Jeff Sibelius channel. You will find more travel content on my sister channel, Family Travel Photos, so I hope you'll subscribe to both. Thanks for watching.